All right, looks like we are live. Um, want to greet everyone, everyone uh, ETM Hotep, which is uh, welcome in peace or welcome with satisfaction. And welcome to another uh, Divine Words Wednesdays with the Seshu Ma'ani Medu Nature, where we uh, take small inscriptions and we go through the method of transliterating and translating. You know, um, for the sake of time, we choose smaller inscriptions, uh, more simpler inscriptions, just to um, demonstrate the methodology and uh, the steps that it takes to actually transliterate and translate. All right? And we'll do this um, every Wednesday. And we've done quite a few uh, so far. And tonight we'll be doing um, another one that's a little bit more difficult than the ones that we've done before. So hope that you all are enlightened about uh, this inscription. Um, first, I want to um, welcome everyone that's also on the panel. And maybe you know you all can go through and introduce yourselves uh, real quick, and then we could jump right into the transliterations. ETM Hotel, uh, my name is Damian Everly, go by Damo, by way of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I want to welcome everybody to tonight's uh, transliteration and translation of the Hotel. Hotel. ETM Hotel, Dual Dual. My name is Kofi Paisa. And thank you for tuning in. ETM Hotel. This is June, also known as Robert Allen. Uh, thanks to everybody tuning in. Hotel. Hotel. This is um, Tonika, and um, I would just like to say welcome. All right. Chris might have stepped away. Okay, that's fine. All right, so we're going to get jump right back into it. Now, I noticed that um, the thing about Google Hangout <clears throat> and our uh, apologize for the little technical things that we have to technical hoops we have to jump through but in order for me to uh, switch screens I have to come out of the full presentation mode so um, I'll be going back and forth but we can just jump right on into it okay so like I said uh, welcome to Divine Words Wednesdays and we'll be going right over uh, the methods the four steps in order to transliterate and translate committee inscriptions. All right. And before we start, I always like to explain, you know, the the meaning behind our name, Seshu Ma'ani Medu Nature, and who who we are. And we are a membership of like-minded individuals with aspirations of being loyal scribes of divine words. And that's what Seshu Ma'ani Medu Nature means. Seshu means the scribes in the plural and then ma'a is a word for loyal or true and then we have ni medu nature meaning of medu nature or divine words and some people translate medu nature as words of God and that may sound familiar to some people when you when you have a group of people who are loyal to the word of God you know for people who are, have um, familiar with uh, Christianity and things like that but also, we embrace the importance of learning the languages of Kemet, and notice I said languages, plural, um, as a means to enter the world of ancient Kemet and have a meeting of the minds with the illustrious civilization, society, culture, and people responsible for contributing so much to the world, whether realized or not. And our purpose for doing these uh, Divine Words Wednesdays is to give examples of how Sesh Medu Nature, known as hieroglyph, hieroglyphs or the hieroglyphic script, is translated. And in doing so, we address issues such as um, the fact that Sesh Medu Nature or hieroglyphs has been deciphered uh, to the methods for doing so, because we're going to show you the four major, major steps in doing so. And then three, demonstrate that with time, discipline, and patience, anyone can do it. 
and I always like to stress uh, discipline because a lot of times we tend to um, want you know the results really fast you know especially you know in 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 our generation you know where everything is sped up and everything is fast everything is convenient we tend to take for granted those things that should take a time you know and discipline so we have to have the stamina discipline to put in for this kind of work all right and the transliteration methods there are four main steps and step one is to determine the direction in which the signs are to be read all right step two identify and document each individual sign step three group signs into words to be searched in dictionaries and then step four and the final step is to come up with a sensible translation all right now these four steps are immutable um, no matter how much of an expert that you become and we all strive to be experts um, at this you'll always go through these four steps you know uh, it's just that the more proficient and competent you become with the language the faster you'll be but regardless you'll have to always go through these four steps and we're just going to demonstrate uh, these four steps with a sample inscription and this is the inscription that we're using for uh, this session here all right and as you can see um, at first glance you know especially to someone who's not familiar with the language or or how to read it it it's sort of intimidating because you have a lot of um, signs in here even though the inscription is not very big um, and compared to full inscriptions full text and, and books and things like that but the signs are going you know they look like they're um, kind of all over the place you know uh, you see some large images in in there of um, look like humans with uh, some sort of animal head and then you have some smaller images all around that you have uh, wings at the top so you know to someone who's first first time uh, seeing this for the first time it may be a little intimidating but we're gonna uh, fix that alright so this is the inscription that we are gonna work with now the numbers that you see on the screen are just for convenience you know so that when we are talking about different groups of inscriptions we can um, you can identify what we're talking about and where we are in the inscription so they're they're numbered from one through eight all together alright so with that being said we can go through step one step one is to determine the direction in which the signs are to be read alright so that's what you would do throughout this entire inscription so um, one of the panel members if you can uh, go through and if you look at the screen and uh, call off the number and for each number give the direction that those inscriptions are going and then tell us why okay um, number one um, it would be read from um, left to right horizontal Mm -hmm. um, and the reason it would be read from left to right horizontal is the facing of the signs. The signs are facing to the left, so they will be read from left to right. Okay, excellent. Number two, it will be read from, uh, this in here is, um, will be read a little bit different it'd be read I don't really know how to put it in a word but it start from 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 the right but it will go down so I mean I mean so it would be right to uh, right to left vertical mm -hmm. and it will it will curve though over to the left mm -hmm. um what um, as far as in column two, like in number two, these signs under it. What what gave you the indication that is from right to left? This what helped you out with that. The sage plant and the bee is facing toward the right. So okay. I will read it from 
left to right horizontal. Okay. All right. And how about um, number three? Three. Mm -hmm. Number three will also um, be read from left to right horizontal. Okay. And I know that because of the uh, <coughs> vulture uh, facing the right. Okay, so the vulture is facing to the right, so it, that in indicates reading uh, from right to left. Mm hmm. Okay. Right to left, horizontal. All right. Reading vertical, vertical. Okay, right. All right. And uh, number four? Number four will be read from left to right. Vertical. But I would know it would be read from left to right vertical because the cobra is facing toward the left. Okay, good. Next. Num number five, uh, it would be read from left to right. Mm -hmm. And it would be, I know this because the horn viper at the bottom is facing toward the left. Okay. Number six will be read from right to left, right to left horizontal. Okay. And I know that because the horn viper on this side is facing toward the right. Okay. All right. And number seven over here? Uh, number seven will be read from right to left vertical. And I know that because the uh, eagle, the uh, bull, uh, and the hand is, and my art is facing toward the uh, right. So it will be read from right to left, or, I mean, uh, vertical. Okay. And last one, number eight. It will be read from left to right, vertical. Uh, because the uh, eagle, the bull, and the hand, and my eye is facing toward the left. Okay, good. All right. Um, just a, a real quick. Um, as far as the screen showing, uh, can someone verify that um that this screen is showing for the viewers on YouTube? Um, as I'm, I'm unable to see what the what everyone else sees at this moment. As I'm sharing, I'm the one that's sharing my screen. So I just want to make sure before we move on, if someone could verify that um, on the YouTube channel that we're actually looking at this particular inscription. If someone could let me know. People say it's okay. Okay. Appreciate it. Do I? All right. Okay, so I appreciate that. That's uh is that step one. So I'm gonna go back to step one. So step one is to determine the direction in which the signs are to be read. All right. And um so you went through all of the uh numbers and identified the direction. So now with that, now the easiest way to know which directions or you know the fact that um, Brother Kofi, you were saying that what helped you was the direction that these uh, inscriptions were facing. Like you said, the horn viper was facing to the left over here for number five. And like for number three, the vulture here is facing to the right. So you know to read from right to left in that instance. So the common um, rule is that you read into the face of the uh, signs. I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. I don't know if someone has their mic open. Um, but the common rule is to is to read into the face of all of the different signs, and that's and that's very easy to remember because it's it's what we do for regular communication even today. You know, we talk to each other in each other's face or to each other's face. We don't get behind people and then talk to their backs or anything like that. So that's the common uh, rule. Now there are exceptions to that rule. Uh, and what we call retrograde uh, script, where you actually do you actually read 
uh, backwards. But that, but that's a, a rare occurrences. But it actually it does occur. But it happens so rarely that you'll recognize which inscriptions or which text that that takes place in, and, and it'll be something that you'll you'll just know. You'll just come to know as you work with the language. All right. So it's not something that you have to worry about too much. All right. So now, uh, step two. Step two is to identify and document each individual sign. So for the sake of time, we're not going to go through every single sign that's on here. It would take us uh, too long to go through. But um, Sondemo, if you could uh, take us through one of the inscriptions and walk us through uh, one set. And I'll, I'll switch to your screen if you, uh, if you are sharing the screen. So, you. Uh, so uh, you won't, you'll no longer be able to see this inscription. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to your screen. Do I? All right. This is Demo. We're back at the uh, sign list. We're going to want to uh, identify some signs. Let's go to uh, number one. Let's go to uh, row one. Uh, like my brother Kofi said, it'll be uh, read from left to right, horizontal. So first thing we're going to notice is at the very top, we're looking at a piece of something, and to me, it looks like a piece of an animal or a mammal. So we'll go to mammals and we'll look through there and see if we can identify what we're seeing up here, which I'm thinking is a piece, or like a bone or something like that. F's go all the way down, still going. All right, now we see the picture. Still looking through. Uh, here we have it. F18. Tusk. So as you go to the sign list, you'll notify, uh, notice the sign. You see what they're calling this? It? A tusk. Notice the gardener code, so you can look it up, and you start writing down all the functions of it. If it functions as a lo lo logogram, determinative, phonogram. And it gives you different writings. It depends on how it's function, how it fits in. All right, well, now we'll go to the next sign. Right below that, you see they're stacked up, but we're still going from left to right. As you go from left to right, you go down as you see them stacked up. So the one we have in the middle is looking like a body part. And the body parts are located in D. Now, as I say, as you go through this sign list, as we've been going through this, if you've been following for the weeks or if you've been going to the archives, you've been seeing how we've been manipulating our way through this a little bit. So you should be getting familiar with the different parts, the different signs, the different uh, groups. So right now we're in D. We're looking for a hand. It looks like a hand, like somebody trying to shake a hand. Uh, we're still going through. It's a lot of parts in here. You'll get familiar with them as you practice them. Down here, D46. Here's that hand we see. They're calling it a hand. It's a logogram, phonogram, gardener code. All right, now we're still looking on column one, left to right. As I say, you're gonna if they're stacked up, you're gonna go down. So the first thing we're gonna encounter. You see a small sign. If you remember, we looked at that sign before. We went to another glyph in the past. And if, and if anyone was paying attention, we called it a, uh, it, was a it was in the loaves and cakes, in the X. So let's go to the X in the loaves and cakes. It was the first one that popped up. It was the flat, flat loaf. There's the sign. Cardinal code, description, and the function. I say a lot of stuff I'm saying pretty fast, but a lot of stuff I'm assuming that uh, some people already know about different grammars and so forth, but you'll become familiar with it, but I'm assuming that you already have some kind of inclination on it already. So let's go back right now, right behind that sign to the right of that sign, because we're going from left to right. You see a circle with an X in the middle of it. Now that sign I recognized before. We're going to look in the building, buildings 
in parts of buildings. That's when you get to the buildings and parts of buildings, you start seeing the different signs. See the house, shelter. Just keep going down. I remember this one being down some. Falling wall, corners of wall, stones. Here we have it. The circle with the X in the middle of it. They're calling it a village. The garden code is 049. The city. Determinative inhabited area. You see how it functions as a logo brand. All right, let's keep it moving. All right, from left to right, as we go into the next sign, you'll see the sign we should also recognize. We dealt with this one before as well, I believe. Some people call it a flag. Some people say it's an X, but we know it to be a sacred emblem. We're in the R's. There's that hotel. This is a stop on R4. We're not looking at that right now, but that's from a previous lecture that a hotel we dealt with before. All right, here we are. There's that sign. Cloth on a pole. The logogram netter. God. Determinative God. R8 in the garden code. All right, right next to that. You have a symbol, which we know it to be some kind of column. So we'll go to back to the building parts. And we just came through here. And here we have it. 029. But remember when it's standing next to that netter, it's standing up. So they have 029A, but they tend to use as 029. So 029 is a horizontal wooden column, a local ground column, fun, uh, phonogram, and a group writing of it. All right, as we keep moving, we have another. Uh, Two signs stacked on top of each other. So going from left to right, we'll go from top to bottom. So the first sign is looking like something. Well, let's go to it. Remember, the body parts is in the D column. So we'll go to the Ds. It will pass by the heads, the eyes, nose, mouth. All right, there's my arm right there, D36, forearm, logogram, but it's not holding anything. Ah, it's not quite what we're looking for. Let's go down some more. There it is, D37, it's a forearm with the X8. Logogram, give, another logogram, tells you all the function. Remember, write all these down, which did, we were just locating the signs, so we found it. Forearm with the X8 on it. It's in the D section. As so we keep going right up under that, dealt with this one before the horn viper. Where is that at? Column I. Animals, reptiles. Get past the gecko, the turtle, the crocodile. We're still identifying the signs. Here it is I9. The horn viper. I functions as a phonogram, a determinative. Showing you different examples. And the last sign we're going to identify in this first row, as Brother Kofi said, going from left to right horizontal, is a sign everybody talks about, words around their neck. We'll go look in the crowns and dresses. You'll be surprised what they call it if you're not familiar with it already. So we'll go down to the crowns, dress, the staves, etc. Looking at different hats, crowns. Girdles, necklaces.
here we have it. There's that familiar sign that everyone wears. Garnico S34, they call it a sandal strap. Unk, sandal strap. It functions, it depends on how it's written. Most times you see it written as this life logogram. Let's show you an example. That is all we have in that first row. As Brother Kofi said, read it from left to right, horizontal. We just went through and identified. Take your time. And like you said, this is a pretty difficult glyph. Uh, it seems intimidating when you look at it because there's a lot of signs. That's part of the process. You want to know what it says? Take your time, write down the signs. And that complete step two. Dua. All right, Dua. Okay, excellent. Let me get my uh, screen back up. Okay, so hopefully my screen is um, showing again. Um, excellent explanation. <clears throat> and uh, like you said, that definitely completes step two. So as you can see, um, well, first of all, for the sake of time, you know, that was only the signs for inscription one uh, near the number one. But you would do this for the entire inscription that you're working with, no matter what it is. You know, and and that seemed like a long process because just just even going through those few signs in number one, one by one, uh, that took a little bit of time. But what happens is the more you do this, the the less that you'll have to actually look them up because you'll have them memorized. All right, and even at this point right here, uh, before you would sit down and transliterate and translate inscriptions, there's a lot of information that you would already be uh, proficient in. And and one of the the um, sets of information that you already you know have under your belt would be the memorization of what we call the monoliterals. And monoliterals are um, mono meaning one. They're single consonant. They're signs that stand for single consonants. And that would be the closest thing that we would have to an alphabet, to our English alphabet or an alphabet in general. So these monoliterals should already be memorized at this point. By everyone who's, you know, sitting down attempting to do transliterations and translations, so the monoliterals because they're memorized, obviously you would be able to skip those. So, for instance, in inscription number one, um, the hand you would you you know by now you would already know that, you would already know the raised bread loaf, and you would already know the horn viper. So those are three that you wouldn't even have to look up, you know. And then as I said, the more Familiar, the more that you do these exercises, the, the more familiar you become with a lot more signs, such as what we call biliterals and triliterals. And bi meaning two, tri meaning three, those are either uh, signs that represent two consonants or signs that represent three. You know, like the word, like unk here is a triliteral, represents three consonants. You know, now in English, we, we, we write it down as A N K H. But when you transliterate it, it will be three, actually three consonants. Uh, same thing with nature here. It's uh, um, a triliteral. Ah would be considered a biliteral because it contains two consonants, et cetera, et cetera. So that step, even though it seems like it's, it's tedious and long or it could get tedious and long, it actually speeds up, you know, um, with very little effort. You'll, you'll find yourself just being faster and faster naturally. All right, so it's not something that you have to really worry about or be intimidated about. All right, so that was step two. And so, as you can see, step two is a data collecting step because what you're doing is identifying all of the signs and you're documenting um, what you have identified. So, in step one, as Brother Damo had just explained, here is the results of the inscription for number one. So we had F18, the tusk, and then you would uh, also document how this sign can function. Okay, so the, the two pieces of information you definitely will want to document is the Gardner code and then how it functions. Okay, and what we use for this step is called a signs list. And this is an example. What you saw on the screen with Brother uh, Demo was the actual sign list that was produced by Alan H. Gardner that we all use and basically what he's done is he's taken all of the, the individual signs and grouped them according to common 
commonality among each other and categorize them. So, for example, all of the category M, as in Mary, that deals with vegetation. So anytime you're looking up a plant or anything dealing with vegetation, you would, look, you would know to look in the category under M, as in Mary. Uh, category D, as in dog, would it consist of all human body parts. You know, um, category G uh, consists of all birds. So if you ever see a bird sign, you know to look in category G. And then the number you see is a sequential number that the order that he placed them in. So the, these are just used as reference numbers. They have no other meaning um, to them. So it's not that um, that these numbers could uh, speak to any accuracy of anything whatsoever. They're just basically reference numbers so that we can actually talk about it. So if I, for example, if I say, hey, um, look up sign D46, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about without, without me having to draw this hand, you know, and, and everything and then show it to you and stuff. It's just faster for me to just say, hey, look up D46 and then you'll know exactly what I mean. All right, so that was one of the uh, benefits of early Egyptologists such as Gardner, why they did that. All right. But, but here are the results of inscription number one. And you will write down the Gardner code and how it functions. So those are two main pieces of information you will write down for each one. All right. So going back up to our steps, now we're at step three. So once you've done that for the entire inscription here, then you would uh, go to step three. And step three is to group the signs into words to be searched in dictionaries because now that you've identified every sign now we have to group them together you know in, in words to be able to look up in dictionaries. Now one thing about Seshmetunetra or hieroglyphs there's no um, punctuation where there's commas or spaces or periods to let us know where one word ends and another word begins. So this, steps be this step becomes a little tricky but like I said when, you, when you're at this point of transliterations you know, you, you're sitting down and, and doing these exercises, there's information that you would have already learned, you know, prior to this. And, and w one thing that you will learn is how to parse these signs into words, group them together. All right. But for the sake of time, we can uh, go through, uh, I guess, inscription number one as well. And I believe um, Brother June, Brother Robert, if you can... Um, go through inscription one and just uh, explain how how you looked it, look it up into a dictionary and I will if you're sharing your screen I will uh, switch over to the screen so everyone can see okay hold it up so now that we went and uh, collected our data and uh, move on to uh, grouping them and looking them up in the dictionaries Today we're using uh, Mark Vigas 2012 edition. <clears throat> so I'm going to just uh, start at the beginning. Um, now there's a couple ways you can look up uh, these words. Search them through the Gardner codes or you can search them through the transliteration. Um, so today I can show you both. Go to edit. I go down to search. It'll bring up the search box. <clears throat> so first I'll try and do it by the transliteration. So we go to the first sign. <clears throat> we have um, B capital H. So I'll type in B capital H. For the next sign, which is the hand, we have D, lowercase d, I'll type in that. The next sign, we have um, a lowercase t, type in that. Hit enter, and then uh, it would search. Let's see. Oh, I think I did something wrong. Yes, let me, let me try by the... Uh, 
with the Gardner codes. That didn't come up. So for the first one, we have F18, and then I push a space, dash, space. The next time we have D46, space, dash, space. Next sign is X1, space, dash, space. And the next sign is 049. This is actually how I first uh, started learning um, with the language, just pushing pushing numbers into the dictionary and um, just searching stuff. So let's see. That brings up. this let me see I'm at the close I think it's trying to search in that uh, document I got open sorry about that it, it looked like on your search on your search um, window looked like you had it clicked Over there. Uh, once it pops up, I'll be able to. Say it yeah, sorry about that. Okay, something's tripping out. No, and actually, this is this is um, perfectly fine because um, you know any any one of us could run into this same issue with the Vigas dictionary. You know, okay, now see how you have. Um, Oh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now it comes up. Okay. So I yeah, know. I think it was trying to search. I had brought up the other picture just so I could keep looking at it, and I think it was trying to search on that document. But um, all right. So I went back and entered uh, all the Gardner codes with the space dash space in between them, and you can see it pop up right here. This is uh, page 396, and we have all the signs that we were looking at on the picture in their exact order uh, right there. So like I said, this is how I got to, um, when I first got into it, you, I got really familiar with this dictionary, looking up words and um, stuff like that. So now that we got that, we can we know what that uh, first grouping of uh, four signs is. So all right. Sorry about that. My uh, computer is really tripping out right now. I still want to uh, look it up. If you want to look it up by the transliterations, like I said, uh, for the first sign, it was B, capital H. Uh, for the next one, it's D. And then the next one was T. And then search that. Let's see. Yeah, and it brought me right back here. So those are the two different ways to use the dictionary to look up uh, stuff. Let's see, um, what was the next, uh, go with the ne next sign. R8. What's that? Oh, R8? Okay. Yeah, because I can't see the, the, the picture anymore. So, uh, as he says, the next sign is R8. So, if we just look it up by the code, capital R8. And you'll get a lot more instances when you're dealing with just uh, one, one, uh, one sign. So then uh, to figure out, because they threw me in the middle of, of this with uh, 301 instances, how I usually 
figure out how to get to R8 quick is to look at the first uh, first sign right here. So it says F20. So that means I'm in the Fs right now. And if I need to get all the way down to the R's, I'll just move my search down. And then I'll jump back in, in to see where it's at. Uh, probably going to be somewhere closer to the bottom. Let's see. Sound like someone trying to trying to trying to speak saying, uh, another language to you, huh? <laughs> yeah, she's saying R eight, R eight. So okay, so now I jump back into my search bar after going down, realizing I was in the F section. Now I'm in the R. I see my first uh, is R eight, but I need to find R eight by itself without the additional glyphs behind it. So you can either go back into your search bar, scroll back up, or I just uh, just go up until I see R8 alone by itself. And then if I keep going up, now I find it right here. We have uh, three entries of R8 alone and uh, their definitions. Yeah. Oh, and then, like I said, and then, was that 029? Yep. And then, like I said, if uh, in step two you went and did all the data collecting, you would ha also have the transliteration, which you could also put into the search bar to bring you right back to here. So, uh, as Demo said, our next sign we have is 029. <clears throat> So. And that will come up with a lot of results as well. But if you did the yep. um, transliteration as a lower A and then the upper A, it would narrow it down. Yeah, so you just got to uh, just keep working with this stuff. You'll get familiar with the, um, with the signs and with the transliterations. And you'll figure out quicker ways to find it. Uh, like he said, just push, putting in 029 might give you a whole bunch of entries. Putting in the translation in this case uh, still gives us 123 instances, but like I was saying earlier, you can figure out you need 029. Right now, I'm still in the R section, so I know I need to go up. I think yeah, you need to go to the O's to find 029. So right now, okay, I found 029, but there's still glyphs after. So I would go up until I find 029 by itself, and we have it right here, 1390, page 1390. Uh, once again, this is Vegas 2012, and you find the entries right here, and you'll find the definitions. So basically, with step three, uh, you'll just keep on doing this and uh, until you figure out all the uh, groupings of the words and... Um, anything else anybody like to add to that? That's basically how it's done. Okay, that's good. Excellent. <clears throat> all right. Um, all right, let me switch back uh, real quick here. Okay. All right, good. So that was uh, step three. Remember, step three is to group the signs into words to be searched in dictionary. So the dictionary of your, of your choice was Mark Vigas, and that was a 2012 edition. And the latest edition that he has um, is uh, 2015, which is, um, it has more uh, word entries than the 2012 version. So it's an improvement upon the 2012 version. And the Mark Vigas dictionary, the thing about, the good thing about that dictionary is one, that is free. And I know everyone likes free stuff. And then two, it's uh, digital. It's in a PDF format, which in all of the text that's in it, it's uh, searchable. So that way, that's the way that you're able to search by way of uh, transliteration or the Gardner codes. Now, what to keep in mind with that dictionary, um, the transliteration system that's used is called manual manual decodage, and manual decodage is one of the two major transliteration systems that's used. Uh, among Egyptologists and anyone who studies and discusses the language, and it's a system that uses that's case sensitive, so it 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 um, 
eliminates the need to use diacritic marks, which are those small markings, dots, and things that you see around letters. And that's that's a the other form of transliteration system that we call diacritic uh, translation transliterations. So Mark Vigas uses Mary Decodage, which is case sensitive. So instead of, for example, um, the H with the dot under it, <clears throat> which would be a diacritic marking under that under that H, and since you know our keyboards are not readily equipped for those diacritic marks, um, the Vig the uh, Vigas uses Mary Decodage, which is case sensitive. So that particular H would be a capital H, as opposed to the lowercase H, which will be a different represent a different glyph or a different sign. But like I said, those are the things that you would learn prior to even getting to this this point of sitting down and trying to transliterate inscriptions. All right. So, and as a result of step three, um, this is what you would have for that inscription number one. So this is what uh, Brother June was showing. Um, that first grouping here is uh, Behudeti, and here is the uh, this is a transliteration. And here is the definition given inside of the Vigas Dictionary. So you see he of Behudet, which is the wing sun disk. And it's interesting because if you go back to the picture, you see this wing sun disk right here, right in the middle. That's probably the first thing that catches your eyes when you're looking at this picture. All right. And going back. And the next next group will be uh, Netra A which is uh, defined as the great God <clears throat> or the great divinity as some people you know have an issue with the word God but that's for a whole nother topic and then next one we have um, the word D which means to give and then the horn viper that uh, brother Damo um, had pointed out is uh, F which means he or him and in this case, it is a suffix pronoun. But like I said, those are those are you know specifics that you would have learned um, prior to getting to this this point of doing this kind of exercise. And then the last sign is the unk, and a lot of people are familiar with that. Don't even have to look it up. It means life, you know. Uh, pretty much everyone is familiar with that. All right, so that's the results of step three. So I'm going back up to the steps here. All right, now, what you would do, you would do that for the entire inscription again, but for the sake of time, you know, we are only showing for inscription number one up here in the top left-hand corner. All right, but in the final step, step four, what you would do, you would take all of that information that you have from the dictionary, and mind you, remember step two, the tool that you're going to need to perform step two is a sign list. The tool that you need to perform step three is a dictionary. Okay, so you're going to have a sign list um, at your disposal and a dictionary of your choice. Now, like I said, we work with uh, Mark Vigas Dictionary because of its e easiness, um, but there's other dictionaries out there, and I personally recommend everyone to get all the dictionaries that you can because uh, some dictionaries have more entries than others. Some of them have more details than others, and then it becomes a personal preference of your choice. <clears throat> As of now, the most exhaustive dictionary that's out there published is called the Waterbach uh, Dictionary. And it's, it's a whole title, and I forgot the exact uh, name, but it's in German. So it's a dictionary that's handwritten, so that means you have to get used to the penmanship of the authors. And I believe the authors is uh, Ehrman and... Um, Grapal are the two main authors of that of that work, and it took them years to develop it. But they have the um, it's handwritten. They have um, thousands upon thousands of entries, um, the multiple meanings of the different words, and they have the sources where you can find these words in actual primary inscriptions, primary texts, and things. So it's a very good dictionary. Uh, unfortunately, it's in German. So you have to be familiar with German, and you have to get used to it being handwritten. Um, so outside of that, uh, we have uh, Raymond Faulkner's Dictionary, which is also handwritten, and it's handwritten in English. Um, and he has a dictionary published, but it's just for Middle Egyptian. Um, and Mark Vigas, the Mark Vigas that we're using here, 
it contains all of Raymond Faulkner's uh, entries. Um, and like I said, this is uh, free and it's also searchable. So this is uh, why this is preferred. But I, as I said, I recommend everyone to get all the dictionaries that you can because you can never be uh, too short of any resources. All right. So now, coming from step three to step four, step four, you would um, take what you've collected in step two and, and what you've collected in step three by way of the dictionaries and then come up with a sensible translation. And your translation, this entire process is like a detective uh, CSI um, work, you know, uh, private detective uh, type of work. So you're going to go back and forth with what makes sense. Some things may not make sense at first because this is where you have to bring what you've collected into English. And there's rarely, rarely will you ever find a one-to-one -one translation of a word from a source language into a target language. So the source language here for us would be Rodney Kemet, which is the language of, of ancient Egypt. And we're bringing that into English. And like I said, it's, it's very rare that you'll find a one-for-one. -one. So sometimes, because the grammar is different and, and the nuances are different, the way that we uh, say things are, are um, different, our, our um, manner of, of nomenclature and idioms we use today are different. So we have to kind of be mindful of that. So this is why different translations of, of one particular text, you'll find a slight small differences. So if I was to trans translate a, an inscription versus anyone on the panel or any anyone viewing, we may have very small minor differences because of that. But transliteration is more of an exact science because you're taking the actual sign and transliterating it into uh, some type of um, standard orthography that we choose or standard script that we choose. So in this case, it would be manual decoded. So all of our transliterations will be the same, but our translations may be slightly different. You know, for example, uh, somebody may, may translate something as the king, the wife of the king, whereas another person may just simply say queen. You know, so little things like that. All right, just to give an example. But anyway, so step four is where you come up with a sensible translation. And let's see. Now here are the uh, full transliterations of the entire uh, picture that we're looking at. And you would, you would have all of this information at step two and between a, step, between a combination of step two and step three. Step two would give you all of the transliterations and then step three will tell you how they're grouped into these words here. So this is for inscription one, then we have two through four, five, six and then seven and eight. All right. And then based on step three, you come to step four and you will walk away with the uh, translation. So maybe somebody, um, uh, well, you're going to have to look at my screen to do it. So, and we could read, maybe somebody else can read um, the full translation of, of the inscription. Translation, he of Behudet, great divinity, gives life. King of Upper and Lower Kemet, aha, Keprakara, given life. Beloved of Nehbet, given life, health and dominion. Beloved of Wajet, mistress of Pe, given life, health and dominion. Set, he of Nu. Gives life, all stability, dominion, and all health like Ra. Set, he of Nu. Gives life, all stability, dominion, and all joy like Ra. Heru, strong bull, beloved of my. Okay, good, excellent. And pardon that misspelling on uh, number two for beloved. But now, so let's take this translation and let's. Uh, quickly compare it to the picture. So here we have them numbered the same way that they're numbered in the picture. So we have one through eight. All right, so one, this is a translation of one. So let's just go back to the picture. 
And if you remember what it said, he of Behudet, great divinity, gives life. And this is Behudet. This is um, what the actual dictionary um, told us that it is the winged sun disk. So, you know, and if you look further into the culture and further further into who Behudet or Behudeti is, he of Behudet, you'll 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 start to read or understand about the story of the war and the fighting um, between Heru and Sutuk or Sutesh and um, how the name Behudet came about and things. And notice over here on the right hand side in the right upper corner where the inscriptions are damaged. Um, now this is a later, this is a picture of the actual primary inscription, the actual real primary piece. Uh, but this is a picture that was taken at a later date. There um, also exist pictures of the same inscription before this damage was done. And the inscriptions that, we, that are missing here are the exact same that's on the top left here. They're just facing the other way. Sim similar to how column 8 or inscription 8 is the same as column or inscription 7. They're identical. They're just facing inward. So we had the same instance with um, inscription 1 and then over here in the top right uh, it was the same thing. So it's just uh, missing here. Just wanted to point that out because a lot of times you'll see inscriptions where some of it's damaged and a lot of in major inscriptions once you get used to them they'll be repetitive so you'll be able to fill in for example, let's say this in number eight here where my cursor is, this um, conical loaf was missing or damaged. You, you know, uh, there's a lot of clues that will indicate what that is based on what's on the other side or just having a familiarity of these different phrases and things the more that you uh, perform these exercises. All right, so, okay, so that was number one. And we go back down to two through four and this is something that I wanted to uh, point out um, so two through four says king of upper and lower Kemet Ah Keper Ka Ra given life beloved of Nekibet given life health and dominion so I want to stop there so we have king of upper and lower Kemet and then we have the name Ah Keper Ka Ra given life and then we have beloved of Nekibet given life, health, and dominion. So let's go back up. All right, so this is number two. Okay, we, when we say king of upper and lower Kemet, this is what we see when we see this these top four signs, Nisut Biti. And yesterday we we had a, a show where we um, had a special guest, um, author uh, Asar Imhotep, and he has a book about this particular phrase here, Nisut Biti. So um, for those who missed out, definitely um, go in the archives. It, uh, we did that yesterday and watch that because he had a chance to uh, give an overview of the book, an excellent book that's breaking down the title of king and uh, leadership, the leadership roles in these African communities. All right. But in summary, most people will translate this as the king of upper and lower Kemet, or they'll say dual king. So that's what these four signs represent. And then we have what's called the Shinu or cartouche, as most people may be familiar with this. Um, and in, inside of it, we will always have a name uh, inside. So this is the actual king's name. And that's what we read, Ah, Keper, Ka, and then Ra. All right. And there's things going on inside here. Um, one in particular is called honorific transposition. And that's something that you would uh, have learned, you know, prior to sitting down attempting uh, these kind of exercises. Uh, but what I wanted to point out is below this where we have D unk, which is uh, gives life. And then going over here to the left, we have Mary, which means beloved. And that's where it ends. And it looks like we were going, we're going up. But instead of going from the bottom up, we start up here at the top. And this is what the brother Kofi was explaining here, where we have Nekibet here, the name here. Um, and then we read down, Diank Senebwa. So 
I want to point. I'm pointing this out because um, some inscriptions, and particularly this, like this one, it is a little tricky. You know, at first, especially to anyone who's a novice or a beginner, this this will be very uh, tricky to kind of figure out the order in which to read. You know, the words. We know the directions of the signs, but it'd be kind of tricky to know the order in which to read these. So, so this comes with a little bit of practice and more in familiarity with these kinds of inscriptions. So it's not something that you will readily get, you know, at first glance, but it's something that you will definitely discover. Um, so I say that to, to say not, you know, there's no need to be intimidated about it or, or anything like that. You will, you would figure this out eventually. It's just something that you may not uh, see right away. All right. And that gets into uh, knowing a little bit about the grammar and so on and so forth. But in this particular inscription, it will work its way from the Nisud Biti on down. And then because this is in the middle, we're dealing with uh, symmetry here. So we have Nisud Biti and then the name. And then we have Di Unk, which is gives life. And this is in the middle. So now we branch off. We have Meri on the left and we have Meri on the right going the other way. So to keep up the, with the uh, symmetry. So Mary is the, is the word beloved. So on this side, on the left side, we have beloved of who? Nekibet. And on the right hand side, we have beloved of who? And we have Wajet up here. And you can see her name right next to her, right behind her. So we have Wajet and Nekibet. And that's how you would know to you know read the rest. The rest of the signs repeat on both sides. And if you notice, we have the papyrus plant on one and then the lotus on the other or the water lily as it's technically called um, on the other all right and like I said if you look more into the culture you know and you're familiar with more you know more of the culture and more of the inscriptions and text um, you'll come to find that Nekibet and Wajet are two um, very important uh, deities of upper and lower Kemet, you know, and these are are representative uh, on the forehead of the king as the vulture and the cobra that you see, Nekibet and Wajet. All right, and they're and they're known together as the two ladies or Nebti. All right, just uh, for uh, FYI. All right, but yeah, I just wanted to point that out. And is there anything else anybody else wants to point out uh, on the picture <clears throat> that that may be of interest to anybody? Okay, well, one other thing. Um, we have these large figures figures in the picture. So who are they? You know who they they're identical, they look identical um as far as looks, but are they the same person, and who is it fish right, and how we um we can actually see that the name here right above number five on the left hand side and right above six on the right hand side, they are identical. It's just that one is read from left to right, as Brother Kofi said earlier, and the other one is read from right to left. Okay, so we have the Unk, and then we have Nebti, meaning he of Nubt. And this is a common title for Sutek or Sutesh or Set. And that's something that you would get, you know, you would be, come to know when you're dealing more with the culture and, and uh, getting familiar with the different deities and their epithets. All right. Um, anything else stands out that anybody else uh, see that we forgot to mention or, or may want to... Um, you can see on one side where uh, Set or Sesh is pointing the unk up at Haru, I guess giving Haru life. Okay, on the left-hand side. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then right. on the other side, you have him with the ump and the wild scepter pointing at the nose of Haru. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's the difference. Okay, that's good. 
and then also uh, under under um, the arm under the elbow on the left hand side we can see these three signs here we have the Y scepter the Jed pillar and then we have the basket here and on the right hand side we have the exact same thing with the first three signs but then right under it we see a difference so over here on the right versus over on the left that's where they differ and then at the bottom they're the same again okay so obviously something is is uh, similar but not identical so something you know so that's an indication so when we go back to our transliteration that should reflect in our transliteration so here we have in uh, line 5 Sutek Nebti DF Unk Jedwas Neb Seneb Neb Mira so here is where the the uh, likeness stops so we have Jedwas Neb Jedwas Neb then we have Seneb Neb Mira versus Awut Ib Neb Mira alright so that's a clue you know that these little clues you know help you to come away with a more accurate um, rendition of your work so and then we go to our translation it should also reflect that difference as well so in number five we have set he of Nupt which is a city and by the way this is a city of gold alright um, gives life all stability dominion and all health like Ra and here set he of Nupt gives life which is the same all stability is the same dominion is the same and now here's where it changes all joy like Ra so in one instance it gives all joy in other instance it gives all health so those are the differences let's go back to the picture and you see so it reflects here it's the word Seneb which means to be healthy and then Awud Ib means to be happy or joy to have joy so so these are little things that you know you can kind of double check and triple check your own work and make sure everything is in logical order and makes sense and and everything so I hope I hope um, hope that was clear you know like I said we you know for the sake of time we choose smaller inscriptions um, just to go over the methods you know for those who are already familiar with this process you know this may seem like a, a simple inscription you know and something that's a piece of cake and things like that um, and and no matter how much of an expert you are you should always always brush up on the basics you know and then for those who are new to this then this is this should be very informative to you and and actually inspiring you know uh, to let you know that this could be done because all of us are doing it, myself, everybody on it, or everyone on the panel. Um, there was a time when we didn't know any of this at all. You know, it just looked like beautiful writing. You know, um, but now we can do it, and so can you. So, with that, does anyone on the house have anything else to point out on here? Um, yes, I know we went um, over the the Chinu, but you probably might want to. Um, Elaborate a little bit on the Sarek that we have also in inscriptions. Okay. And by Sarek, you mean over here in inscription seven and right. inscription eight. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you want to want to speak on that? I thought any anyone on the panel might want to speak on that in case. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, um, in here we have the Shinu, as we as we did discuss that, but we didn't discuss the Sarek. And the Sarek is over here on the left hand side and the right hand side, where you see it looks like a tall rectangle, where you see perched on top of it is a falcon, with the double crown of Upper and Lower Kemet, and the same, even though it's a little damaged, on the right hand side, the same thing. Now inside the Sarek which is similar in function to a Shinu, you'll have a name. And the Sarek, Sarek houses the Heru name of the king. And, you know, the king, ever since the fifth dynasty, from the fifth dynasty on, the kings had five uh, great names, or we call it uh, Renwer, which means great name, great names, Renuwer, Weru, 
great names. And the first of those great names is called the Heru name. And the Heru name starts with Heru, as the falcon you see here, which is in the language is the word Bik, which means falcon. So we have Bik or Heru. And then um, within the Sorek, we have the Heru name itself. Now the Sorek itself, like this cartouche, is really a rope. All right, this is a rope, and in most instances, when you when you look at very detailed um, carvings by the scribes, you can actually see the um, the coil the coils of the rope right here at the bottom of the chenou. But as far as the sarek, the sarek is actually a facade of a palace, you know, and then the the bottom has you know the um, what they call the the facade markings of of some kind of uh, palace or enclosure and then on here uh, within here I should say you have the name alright so so this particular uh, king Nisud Biti is A Kepraka Ra that's his throne name Nisud Biti name and Nisud Biti name is um, the throne name out of the five this will be one of those names um, so to name the five we have the Heru name then we have the uh, two ladies. Um, the t uh, actually, we have the Heru. I'm going to put them in order. We have the Heru name, which is represented in this picture. Then we have the Heru of gold name, which we don't see in this picture. Then we have the Nebti name, uh, which we don't see in this picture, but they're represented by uh, Nekibet and Wajet. And then we have the throne name of the king. And then the fifth and final one would be the family name and unfortunately for us uh, what early Egyptologists have done in all of the literature you know that we've come to know we know a lot, all of the kings by their family names and I say that that's kind of unfortunate because in ancient times the people themselves the population the citizens of Kemet um, they would refer to the king by his throne name and not his family name out of respect so the throne name here would be Nisud Biti Ahakepakara. So this is the name that they would um, be f be familiar with and 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 use in re in referring to the king. But today we know most of these kings by their family name, which is preceded by the word Sa-Ra. And I'm sure you all, a lot of people have heard Sa-Ra, which is the son of Ra, um, being used. So Sara and then whatever the name is. So for example, um, what's a good example? Um, Maat Kara is the throne name of a female king, Hatshepsut. Now we know her as Hatshepsut because that's her Sara name. So that's a perfect example. If I if I were to just casually say, you know, Men Kara, a lot of people won't know who I'm talking about. But in ancient times, if we were living in that, those times, we we would be using Maat Kara instead of Hatshepsut. All right, so just to give a little background on that, but but the uh, Sarek, that's what the Sarek is. The word Sarek itself means to to make known, to make something known. All right, and um, so yeah, and hopefully that that um, kind of touched on that. Like I said, for the sake of time, you know, we're just uh, going over a few things. Was there anything else? <clears throat> um, um, no, but I have a question from um, from someone watching, Sean Phillips. I don't know if we could take it now. I think you probably, you did touch on it, but just in case for those who joined in on the viewing um, at a later time, maybe you could just go over it again. Mm-hmm. So what he was asking was, um, I got a question if you all have time to answer it. Why would column two be second to be read from at school days up, if, um, up at first turns? So you probably might want to go over that again. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the last part? Why would column two be read uh, second? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I did mention it earlier that these numbers are not um they're not numbered for the purposes of uh, reading the entire inscription, they're, they're not they're not put here to number the entire inscription. They're only the numbers are only put here 
um, out of convenience so that we can discuss the different glyphs, you know, absent of me pointing with my cursor. So, you know, if I say, if I'm talking about the inscription next to number one, it's just um, visually you'll know where I'm talking about and what I'm talking about. Number two, now you know where I'm talking about and what I'm talking about um, and so on and so forth. So they're not, they're not put in a, a definite order. So hopefully uh, the brother uh, can understand that. So it's not like uh, you jump from number one and then you would automatically go to number two. Now in some cases it ends up being that way, but uh, just for the sake of demonstration, these numbers are here. Uh, because like I said, if, th if this inscription was not damaged over here, this, these, the top would be pretty much go together and it would be identical to read together. He of Behudet, uh, the great divinity, um, Give her, give him, gives him life, and this is Behudet in the middle. So you have that symmetry going on in the, in the top, just like you have symmetry overall between the left and the right, Sarex. All right, so, uh, so hopefully that kind of answered his his question. All right, um, and a lot of times when we when we do these on on Wednesdays, just keep that in mind for the viewers who are who are gonna uh, watch and and. Um, participate with us, uh, just remember that th these numbers, um, sometimes they're not here for the order per se as so much just to be able to identify and talk about it. Because, right, you know, we could have put letters here um, or whatever. All right, so hopefully that that kind of clarifies that. But thanks for the question. Definitely do I for, the, for that question because maybe some other people wonder the same thing. All right. Well, if that's it, um, I would like, you know, I, I've been saying, you know, a few times that uh, prior to you coming to the point of sitting down and transliterating and translating, you know, there's a lot of information that you would have learned already and be proficient in and so on. And, um, and on the flip side, you know, this is something that you can do. Um, as a beginner, once you once you study the the foundational information um, and and all of the information that that lays a nice thick foundation uh, with you, you'll be able to do this. And um, there's a a book and a course that go together where the book is used as a textbook. And it is the Beginner's Introduction to Meta Nature, the Ancient Egyptian Hieroglyphic System, and it's available along with flashcards for what would be considered the alphabet. Earlier I mentioned monoliterals, uh, which are signs that represent single consonants. This will be the closest thing that we would have to an alphabet, and those are to be memorized. They have to be memorized, you know. And then in this lesson, in the book and in the in the in the course, if you so choose to take the course, you'll come to know know the importance of doing that. But the flashcards are available, the book is available, as well as classes are available, and we have interactive classes as well as um, self-study classes where you can uh, just purchase the book and walk through the book yourself or participate in an interactive class. And, and in either case, at the end of your study, there is a uh, certification exam where you have to demonstrate that you have proficiency in using the material, using the tools that, that was taught in the lessons within the book or in the class. All right. So the class is a certification uh, class, and once you pass, you know, with no problems, then you'll be certified as a beginner, and you will definitely be able to sit here and transliterate and translate. That's something that's guaranteed in the course. All right. So I just wanted to let let that be known, and all of this is available at the website metonetra.com, which is on the bottom of the screen www.mdw-ntr.com. So with that, does anybody have any other uh, remarks, closing remarks, anything that I'm missing? And I will uh, change my screen over so everyone else can be seen. And we have um, Brother Antoine joined us, Brother Damo, Brother Robert, Brother Kofi, and Sister Sonette. Tonika and myself uh, will jowl.
And we also have Elder uh, Atiba as well. Just saw him. So I want to say do all for everyone um, hanging out and watching. And since there's no other uh, closing remarks, I will say I will end our Divine Words Wednesday with the departure uh, statement, which is an ancient way of departing one another. And we would say Shem Imhotep. And the word Shem means to leave or to exit. Uh, and M is in or within. And uh, Hotep is peace. You know, um, actually, Hotep is an offering, but it's an offering that brings about a state of peace. So it has a, you know, derived meaning of peace. So we say Shemim Hotep, and that is to leave in peace. And in the beginning, if you heard, hit, heard what I said, I say Etim Hotep, which means welcome in peace. So here I am saying Shemim Hotep, which means to depart or to leave in peace. And with that, that, with that I'll say it again, Shemim Hotep. And we'll see you next week for Divine Words Wednesday. Shemim Hotep.